questions about that today. Also, we want to talk to him about an article he wrote just recently in terms of uh, the executive orders that the president is threatening to use at this point in time. While we're waiting for John Fun, I think I should point out something. We have him on the line. Okay, John Fun, welcome to the show. George, a pleasure to hear from you. Thank All you. Right. Thanks for joining us today. All right, let's ch check a little, chat a little bit about what the president is threatening to do, to use his pen and use the phone. Do you think this is an idle threat? Do you think he could do much damage with executive orders, or is it mostly a lot of wind on his part to sort of uh, uh, put on a show for his political base? Well, both could be true. Um, let's say you're a small business person and you're doing uh, work for the federal government, and you have a very thin profit margin. Suddenly the president has decided that instead of $7.25 an hour for certain jobs, you're going to have to pay $10.10 an hour, and your competitors who are larger can absorb that into their cost structure. And you, on the other hand, may not be able to do that. You might be driven out of business. I would say that's doing damage. Well, uh, let me ask this. Don't you find it amazing that people who are obeying the law and paying a minimum wage, small businesses, fast food places, et cetera, that they're being demonized for obeying the law? I mean, is this sort of the new leftist thing to change the subject? And the, uh, you may have noticed in the papers just this week, the Port Authority in New York and New Jersey, an agency I ran back in the mid-90s, they have told all their vendors connected to the airports, et cetera, at least on the New York side, as far as I know, Governor Christie on his side of the Hudson has rejected this. But again, you're ordering vendors and saying, do it or else, but you're obeying the law. Well, what do you think this is all about? Well, I don't think it's anything new. I think it's something old and, and it's class struggle. It's, you know, basically dividing people into two classes, the exploited and the exploiters. Uh, it's not a particularly American thing in terms of our history. Americans have not been particularly in interested in the class struggle that has uh, gripped Europe, for example. Uh, we're a different kind of country. But there's people who are trying to re re you know, bring back those ancient animosities and stoke them. Well, certainly we're seeing that in the city of New York and Mayor de Blasio, who speaks of a tale of two cities. But wouldn't you agree, while there may be a tale of two cities, rich and poor, it's because the liberals over the last half a century have destroyed the middle class in New York City and des destroyed middle class jobs. So with high taxes, high regulations, and manufacturing, et cetera, has died in the state of New York. So uh, is the root cause liberalism for this great divide in your judgment? Well, I think you've said it, which is, for example, the island of Manhattan. You can live on it if you're very poor because the government will subsidize you. You can live on it if you're extremely rich because you can afford to pay almost any tax rate that the government imposes on you. But if you're just a struggling homeowner or struggling renter, um, I, guess they, uh, I guess they have a place for you somewhere up in Newburgh. <laughs> well, the interesting thing is when you look at, say, take New York State, which is true about this, this tale of two states, a tale of two cities, Population of New York between 1970 and 2010 went from 18 million to 19 million, while Texas, for instance, during that same period, went from 11 million to 25 million people. Maybe it's because they've encouraged middle class housing and middle class jobs down there. So, again, that's the great divide. Are we seeing this, the Northeast dying because of themselves, the liberals in the West and Southwest uh, uh, thriving? because they have a completely different position from what the de Blasios in the world uh, do. Well, part of the problem with politicians in the Northeast is there are two ways you can win. Um, you can win by having a very prosperous economy, and that brings in people and capital. Uh, on the other hand, it also means that there's less need for government services, less need for your abilities at um, organizing union people, um, basically providing more and more government. So rather than have a growing economy, if you want to win politically, you can easily do that, but the economy dies underneath you. In other words, you've inherited a ruin, but at least it's your ruin. Well, I think you're right. Uh, other executive orders that you might be concerned about? Anything else? Oh, yes. For example, on climate change, uh, you know, the Congress rejected Obama's cap-and-trade 
tax, uh, rejected it with almost no Democratic support in the end because, of course, it would have destroyed jobs in the middle of the recession. Well, it may come back in various forms. You may see Obama's strike against coal companies. He's trying to basically put an entire business out of work. Um, now, again, these may not be legal, George, but Obama has three years to go in his presidency, and his view is, gee, it'll take about three years for the courts to catch up with me. And, you know, in the meantime, I get the headlines, I get my um, policies put into place, catch me if you can. And the real problem here, of course, is that I think luckily the courts would eventually rule against him. For example, did you know that nine times in the last two years the Supreme Court has unanimously slapped down the Obama administration for exceeding its authority nine times? Yeah, I've heard that number. Uh, do we expect a number, a few more cases coming down this year as well? Oh, well, just this week there was a three-judge panel, including an Obama appointee, a three-judge panel on the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals out of the Midwest, and they ruled the Obama administration had violated its authority by not following the Freedom of Information Act. They were trying to conceal uh, the growth of the food stamp program. And they had prevented uh, people who had asked for that information legally, practically, and they had refused that information to them. And the courts, the three to zero vote, said, you're violating the FOIA. Again, the most transparent administration in history is the most obfuscating administration in history and the most secretive administration in history. I never thought I'd agree with the New York Times editorial board. But they have said this is the most secretive administration since Richard Nixon. Uh, I don't know if they're a secretive Richard Nixon. They may have been paranoid. Okay, but now what comes to mind is the historian Richard Hofstetter, uh, who is a liberal and won the Pulitzer Prize a couple of times, who said that there are illiberal liberals, that they tend to be tolerant as long as you agree with them. So does Obama, in your judgment, personify that view of tolerance, that it's my way or the highway? Well, there's an incipient authoritarian in all of us, isn't there? Uh, except that when you're... Uh, I don't know about you, but I was weaned on the milk of human kindness, but go ahead. I understand. I'm in t I'm, we're all fallen creatures, however. Uh, we're all pr prey to temptation. Uh, wow. we, we learned that from the good book. But, but George, I think Obama... Uh, obviously, being a superior being, and like many illiberal liberals, believes he knows what's best for all of us, and therefore you're getting in the way if you're challenging his methods, because he, of course, is leading us to the path of goodness and sweetness and light. It's interesting. I started reading, broke, cracked open last night, Fred Siegel's new book, uh, Against the Masses. Against the Masses, yes. <clears throat> I got through the first 30 or 40 pages. I think it's an extraordinary book. I think Fred, coming from that old left-wing sort of world, so it hits it on the head when he shows the, the grandfathers of, of Obanco, uh, Barack Obama, you know, Crowley and some of the early liberals, and this, the, the hatred and H.G. Wells, how they despised the middle class, how they despised capitalists, and how they believed they were the chosen people, the enlightened ones. And sort of we've been watching this now for 80 years, almost 100 years. I figure Woodrow Wilson was, was inaugurated 100 years ago. Uh, last March 31st. So this is nothing new, but the problem is, uh, you know, no one seems to know about this anymore. It's because of the educational system that's failed. The whole concept of this liberal ideologue is just sort of lost. So, you know, what do we do about it? You know, what, what is a congressman supposed to do when the president just decides he's above the law? Are they doing enough, in your judgment, doing enough screaming? I think there should be a select committee in the House of Representatives, because, of course, the Senate wouldn't have that under Harry Reid, but a select committee would have its own chief counsel, its own investigative ability, and it would be solely dedicated towards trying to write and preserve the constitutional balance that the Founding Fathers had in mind for us. Um, I think this would highlight at least the issue in the minds of the public and get them to think. I mean, we don't teach the Constitution in our schools anymore, but people inherently support a separation of powers if they hear about it. If they hear that the president is basically ignoring Congress, which is the branch designed to write the laws, and basically writing law as well as enforcing law, I think that they would rebel against that because it doesn't seem right. Even if they don't know the intricacies of the Constitution, they do know <clears throat> the temptations of power. And I think that the more that we talk about it, the more the president may feel constrained 
because we do know that he's increasingly unpopular. As you'll figured out, um, his, his approval numbers are now below 40% uh, across the country, and in many states below 25%. So I think it is having an impact because the more the president doesn't fix the economy and the more that he takes extraordinary and unauthorized and impermissible methods to try to um, impose his policies, the less popular he becomes on both grounds. Well, with his popularity dropping as it is, uh, his State of the Union address uh, the other night, do you think it was just small ball kind of stuff? Do you think it's going to have any impact? Do you think the, the minimum wage argument is going to carry the nation here? Do you think this is just a sort of uh, desperate move, hoping to get some attention to a subject that makes him popular again? What do you think is going to happen? Well, George, you're a student of um, numbers, and I'll simply throw this out. Um, I believe that the things like the minimum wage and raising taxes on the wealthy are always going to be popular. Think about this. You're sitting at home, um, a perfect stranger calls you up on the phone, and they say, do you support a minimum wage for people, or do you support raising taxes on the rich? Now, a perfect stranger calls you, you're either not going to answer the question, or you'll be tempted to give the socially acceptable answer. Mm. So you have to drill deeper and ask the question in different forms. If you ask the question on minimum wage in different forms, do you believe that it will ultimately cost more jobs than it creates? By 54% to 41%, the country says it will cost more jobs than it will create. As for uh, raising taxes on the rich, everybody supports raising taxes on the rich, but do people actually believe that it will create more jobs and more economic growth? No, they don't. So I think you have to – the polling that we so – with such facility except actually is a lot more complicated. So all I will say is Michael Barone, author of the Almanac of American Politics, has consistently said class warfare is the most overused and underperforming political tactic in American political history. It has been tried over and over again, but it very seldom gives its demagogic supporters the political benefits that they believe are there. We've got about 30 seconds left, John. So in your judgment, if the Republicans don't shoot themselves in the head this spring, do you think we could keep the House and uh, regain the Senate? Well, the, if you look at the headlines today from Washington, Democrats are abandoning uh, an attempt to take back control of the House and putting all of their marbles and chips on the side of keeping the Senate. I say they're on the run, and I say there are 11 Democratic seats in contention for the Senate, only two Republicans. You do the math. They're in trouble. The Republicans are much less so. John, I thank you so much for joining us. Look forward to talking to you again. Thank you, George. Bye -bye. And you do great on radio. Thank you, sir. Coming up in our next segment, I'm going to be talking to who, uh, Steve Malanga, senior editor of the City Journal and a member of the, a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute. And this is George Mullen filling in with Steve Malsberg on Newsmax TV. The Steve Malsberg 